I always say, like, if you're going to get involved in something, just give until it hurts a little bit, meaning you're giving up something. That will make you get more involved, more concerned, instead of just writing the check that you're not going to think about again. I'm Brandon Dawson, and this is The Distiller, a podcast about how we find meaningful work and how we find meaning in the work we do. My guest for this year-end holiday episode is the executive director of Happen, Inc., Tommy Roof. Happen, Inc., if you don't happen to live in Cincinnati or just haven't visited their space in Northside yet, is one of the most joyous places, certainly in Cincinnati, if not the world. It's a Cincinnati-based nonprofit organization bringing families together through shared creative experiences. It's a place where kids gather after school and on weekends to make art, repurpose toys, do maker projects, learn about topics ranging from geology to business, They have house concerts, pretty much anything you can think of that excites the mind and gets people together. Tommy and the crew at Happen have probably done it. Without giving too much away, Tommy's route from advertising agency owner to nonprofit director is a great story, one that involves both the big, huge life shifts we often like to imagine for ourselves and the sort of gradual unfolding of a life's work that seems realistic and like a story we can identify with. Tommy and I met on a Friday afternoon at Tila Bar and Kitchen in Wyoming, a bucolic Cincinnati suburb where people kind of seem to grow up and never leave in the best way. Tila is an American gastropub, great food in a great neighborhood atmosphere, and the owners Doug and LR invited us in midday. And along with the sometimes boisterous Friday afternoon crowd, Tommy and I talked about advertising, creativity, meaningful work, and the half-life of glitter in a television studio. If you do some Google searches about Tommy's history with Happen, you're going to come across articles talking about how Tommy's finally getting the recognition he deserves. I think the thing I love the most about hanging out with Tommy is that he genuinely doesn't seem to care about that. He's doing work he loves, he's invested in it, and that's enough. And that was an inspiration to me to focus on what matters and ignore the rest. It's a powerful message and one perfectly timed for the holidays. So here it is. Here's my conversation with Happen Inc. executive director and founder Tommy Roof on The Distiller. Cheers. Cheers. Thanks for coming out. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Let's start off, if you would, I sort of like to have people tell me what your work is in however you want to phrase it up. Well, I'm the director and founder of Happen Incorporated, okay. and our mission, we're a nonprofit agency, and our mission is just to bring together parents and kids and communities through creative exercises and activities, special events. Right on. Happen's been around for, is it 20 years this 20 year? 20 years. Yep. That's amazing. Thanks. Okay. Thanks. And do you have like, you're a nonprofit, so your, your board probably wants all the stats. Do you have the, this is many, this is how many kids have gone through, or this is how many programs we've run in those 20 years type of figures? Um, well, we know that's in the hundreds of thousands okay. of, of, you know, people that we've worked directly with. Yep. I mean, to give you an idea, uh, it's probably going to happen this weekend with our Happens Toy Lab. Uh-huh. Uh, we will hit number 20,000. Wow. Um, toys so right just that program alone so yeah, yeah, it gives yeah. you an idea okay. of uh you know and even with that program over the summertime and in, in a month and a half two months we have about a thousand kids come through um, right you know wow, that, wow. just that facility yeah alone. so there's there's happen and there's toy lab mm-hmm. are those separate entities no they're all underneath uh, happen incorporated so it's one okay. of eight different programs uh, plus, we have a Make It Space, which is all science and engineering. So that's right around the corner of the Happen Studio. Yep. And we have uh, four gardens in the neighborhood. Um, okay. So we do a lot of outdoor and nature environments. And stuff. what what age range of people that you're working with? Well, we're, we're focusing, our, our main focus is 6 to 12. Okay. But uh, over the last five years, we've grown a teen program for okay. 13 to 17. That cool. is really awesome. And uh, starting in January, we will have toddler programs on Mondays and Fridays for uh, really cool. yeah two to five year olds. So. Oh, wow. All yeah. right. Yeah. I'll come, I'll come and see you. <laughs> awesome. It's such fun stuff. We were, before we officially started recording, I was telling Tommy, my 17 year old, when he was three, four, five, and we were newly to Cincinnati happen and stuff that you were doing then, which now is 14 years ago, 12, 13, 14 years ago, um, was some of our favorite stuff cool. and we were living in norwood and didn't know the city and we'd make the journey over to north side and uh and check out and then for a while we were at the waldorf school which is just 
yeah. happened sort of equidistant between where the Waldorf school was. Right. And right. so we would come after after school and stop by and and uh, we've still got the somewhere I still have the little Christmas tree plate. Yeah. That's that's yeah. coming up next. Uh, yeah, is, that's we call it a happen family tradition. We yep. have several of them now. And that's one of them. So good. So on this coming Thursday night, uh, there'll be families coming in and picking up their plates and I love it. Mrs. Claus and the whole I, thing. I have to say there was one. So as I was doing some research, because mm-hmm. obviously um, you started in 1999. Right. We moved here in 2005. You've been going for a while. There's a lot of stuff that you've done over the years that obviously I didn't even know about. There were TV pilots. Mm, right. <laughs> um, I would love to hear you talk about those. There was an event um, that we went to that I don't know if it was a one-time thing. And and I hope I don't describe this. And you're like, yeah, that wasn't us at all. We didn't have anything <laughs> to do with that. But there was a thing at the glass blowing oh, yeah. studio mm-hmm. in the Pendleton mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. where they made toys and then the glass blowers yeah, made awesome a glass experience. version. Oh, yeah. That was the coolest. So if I can describe it very quickly, you have the toy lab. Part of the toy lab is, I'm going to get this wrong, it's, it's just making toys. Yeah, I mean, the basis is, of it is upcycling. So that's yeah. the life lesson is that people donate their old and broken toys, and then we sort them and clean them and put them in this wacky laboratory yep. and cut them into pieces. And then kids come in, use their own imagination to build their own one-of-a-kind toy. Right. And, uh, you know, kids learn that everything that we use gets discarded in some way, including their toys. Yep. And so upcycling, and they know about recycling, but mm-hmm. upcycling is a new word. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, teaching kids at a very young age that uh, they can create, they can make things, and they can make things out of old things and right. keep all that stuff from landfills. And you know. so, so you had your, your toy scientists, so you had your mad scientists mm-hmm. in lab coats and goggles, and the kids would pick parts. And they made this... Uh, it was like a, like a GI Joe body with a with a machine gun leg, and anyway, uh, it you know it was probably 14 inches tall in toy form, and then they they uh, blown glass they made like a an almost four foot tall version of it out of blown glass. Yeah, yeah, and that's for still an audience. Those. Yeah, yeah, it was so it was, cool. Yeah, it was uh, crazy. And there's a ton of families that that yeah. showed up and. Um, you know, I love those type of experiences, and we seek out those kind of uh, things because, um, you know, happen and, and, and our programs then can connect to a whole nother, you know, part of art. And uh, and so we're sharing both our programs and and another program, and you never know what a kid's going to spark to. So, right. you know, I mean, they maybe out of that 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 event, there's some glass blowers. Who knows, right. you know? Which yeah, who might really grab awesome. a hold of this? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, but this is not, I mean, you have a, you, you have an art background. Yes. Yes. I have a master's in painting. So. But you're not necessarily like a, a nonprofit community. That was not what you started out to do. No. Yeah, I, well, I came here in Cincinnati in 90, 1995. I was working in advertising. So okay. uh, I was an art director and copywriter and um, co-founded an advertising agency. And that's how, um, that's what brought me to Cincinnati from Chicago. Okay. So. okay so you came from Chicago. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So you founded the agency Barefoot mm-hmm. with, uh, Doug Warpel. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Um, and Doug and I have been friends, uh, for a long time. And, uh, he was, uh, going into the advertising creative field. So he was leaving, uh, Procter and Gamble. Mm-hmm. And, um, I was in Chicago. I started doing some freelance stuff for Doug mm-hmm. and, uh, uh, it just kind of grew from there, and then I decided to come to Cincinnati, and we, we started it up. So it's 1995. Yeah. In 1998, not that long mm-hmm. after that, you yeah. decide this isn't this isn't what I'm going to do. Yeah, it was 1988, 1999. I had, well, and I should back up. Um, I was also practicing my own art, so okay. I had a studio over in... Um, off of Short Vine in Quarryville. Okay. And so, you know, I would do the advertising during the day, and at night I was in my studio. Mm-hmm. And um, one day I got a call from the Contemporary Arts Center that said, you know, we'd like to bring some fourth graders through your studio. Oh, cool. To see, you know, how an artist actually works, how a studio works, and all those things. Yeah. And I thought, uh, you know, I can do something more than just have them tour through. I put together a program where they actually got to make art while they're in nice. the studio. Uh-huh. So I had a big space and it was, it was awesome. And, uh, it changed my life. It really, really, really did. Yeah. Uh, on the, on the way out, um, as those kids were getting on the bus, um, 
a friend of mine, Chris Sickles, who uh, helped me that day, he said that these kids are never going to forget this day. And they were getting on the bus with their artwork and everything. And then the next day, everything lined up. I had a meeting in Chicago I, uh, that I was driving to. didn't have a flight. So I was in the car for a one-hour meeting in you Chicago. You could chew on it. Yeah. yeah. And then I really started thinking about what I remember when I was that age in fourth grade and what was really important to me. And um, there was a swim coach, and, and they gave away free swim lessons to parents and kids. And my dad, my father, did, enrolled me in that. We learned how mm -hmm. to swim together. Mm -hmm. And um, that's what I remember being so special. And so um, I really thought, okay, you know, uh, I looked at my life, and I'm part of a successful business. Didn't really have to worry much. Uh, the business was going strong. We became a core supplier to, with P&G. So yep. we're working on Swiffer and launched a Swiffer and Febreze. And I mean, things were moving. Right. Um, and, uh, you know, but I, I really felt like if I was going to do something in the field of art and, 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 and working with families, kind of like that swim coach, mm -hmm. um, I probably had needed to do it then. Mm. And, um, and I had the opportunity to do that, you know, both financially Yep. energy wise, yep. uh, time wise. And, um, yeah. so, uh, yeah, I went back to Doug, um, who totally understood and supported, you know, and, so, and I said, Hey, you know, I really want to try and do some sort of arts program. And at the time I didn't know exactly what it was going to be. Right. Um, but, uh, you know, and I said, Hey, you know, buy me out. Cause I think I could take that little chunk of change and, you know, start this. So yeah. that's what we did. So how long does it take from that day, from the drive to Chicago? How, Probably a good six months. Okay. Just to, just to work out all the details, mm -hmm. you know, and I still worked, uh, it was, we we had an agreement where I still worked for barefoot for, you know, on whatever they needed, really, yeah. for three years after that, okay. you know, so, and I mean, well, it wasn't much, it was, you know, a couple hours here, a couple hours there, that yep. maybe um, something that I'd already worked on previously, that, cool. and um, so, uh, but it was about six months, and I think it took me nine months to uh, open a storefront. Okay. So, yeah. And did you, what's involved in that decision for you? I mean, you're starting a nonprofit. <laughs> yeah. A lot you know, of learning. Yeah, right. A lot of mistakes. I, that's a, when I, I've talked to Libby Hunter was a guest on the show, and we okay. talked about wordplay, and mm -hmm. I've talked to other people running nonprofits. And part of that deal, unless you really come up in that world, is yeah, I'm going to start a nonprofit. It's going to be great. I'm going to save the world and do wonderful things. And then you realize that oh, you got to get a board, and you got to right. do yeah. all of these things that are running a business, but running a different kind of business that has a lot more sort of scrutiny. Yeah, scrutiny and all that. Yeah, I learned a lot. Um, learned a lot by mistakes. Um, but, um, you, you know, I, I it was challenging to, to get started, but it was also exciting and new. And, um, you know, the the sky was the limit, too. There was mm -hmm. no boundaries. So was there know, anything going on, like models that you had for what you wanted to do? No, unfortunately, like, you know, and, and I think that we were at, we started to happen at the right time mm -hmm. in the right place because um, soon after that, there was a whole trend of, you know, family involvement and mm -hmm. everything from, I mean, and, and it, there really wasn't these things going on at different museums and things yet, you know? Right, right. And so we were kind of ahead of the curve there, mm -hmm. um, when we first started. And, uh, so th that helped a lot. And, um, you know, I, 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 we did a lot of big stuff starting out, mm -hmm. um, and, uh, I learned a lot from that too, and kind of honed our skills. And what does that mean? Uh, big stuff at that stage. Well, uh, I, within our second year, a, a lot of people want to partner with us, and uh -huh. just you know, uh, and I think what what we do best is to come up with you know creative content. Mm -hmm. And uh, so one of our first partnerships was with uh, a company. Um, it's not around anymore, but they used to do Pepsi jamming on Maine and they did these huge festivals. Right, right, right. And so they came to me, Bob Elias came to me and said, uh, you know, do you have any ideas on what you could do for our kids? Okay. Cause they were starting a new pro, a new event, uh, downtown. Mm -hmm. So I came up with this, uh, crazy idea to do these, uh, stations at uh, government square with the bus terminals, uh -huh. thinking that they would not go for it. I mean, it was a huge project. It was like a hundred thousand dollar project. Right. Too, There's you know? no way they're going to yeah. let me do this. And they said, yeah. yes. Right on. <laughs> and, you know, that was oh, amazing. It was like, uh, now you know, I got to figure it out. Yeah. Um, and, uh, 
it was it was exciting. It was scary too. I'll never forget the police chief uh, the day of the when the event opened up, and they because they rerouted all the buses. Oh wow! You know, and the police yeah. chief came to me and said, you know, Government Square is yours now. <laughs> you know, and so we had semis <laughs> come in and you know That's set so all great. our stuff up, and huh. it was crazy. You know, um, and, and fun. Um, mm-hmm. So, but I learned that also from that is that. Um, our mission is not really the events, you right, know? right, right. I mean, and we could have gone in that direction, yeah. but I think, you know, having a board and having, having a mission and having, uh, like realizing where you need to be, you mm-hmm. know, I, I think it was great that we experimented, did some of these big, bigger things, yep. but, um, it really wasn't meeting our direct mission of having, you know, every day be able to offer families to come in and yeah. do it, sit down relax and do activities together you know so how has i mean specifically how has the core mission changed from 20 years ago to now um well i'll go to uh the recession i mean we were on a growth rate of 25 percent each year Mm -hmm. and um the recession hit where in like 2010 we would have been probably at a million dollar budget wow even in that in that and and i've also learned 25 percent growth for any business is like that's a, I don't that's know how tough to keep yeah, up. Right. Yeah, yeah. Um, but uh, the the best thing that happened to us, I think, was the recession. So um, hmm. not it, many people would say. Uh, yeah, and, you know, that. during while I was going on, I wouldn't have said that. But looking back now, yeah. Um, because what happened was, is you know, our business plan, which is still uh, our model, is like our bread and butter, our way we survive is individuals. Mm-hmm. So, you know, we also have foundations and grants and service fees and toy lab helps offset yeah. all the free programs that we do. Um, but, uh, it's really families and individuals grassroots. And when the recession hit, we found, you know, people were losing their jobs. And so yeah. they didn't, didn't have the income to donate. Mm-hmm. Um, but what happened also is that we had all these families that really needed free or inexpensive activities to do with their kids. Yep. So there's like a line out our door, you know, of, for right. all our free programs. Right. Um, but I can remember there was a week where CNN did a special report on what, what do you do when you're laid off from work? You know, what do you do with your life? Mm-hmm. And the number one thing they kept coming back to is volunteer, get involved in your community. Right so I had phone ringing off the hook of when really? to get involved. And that's how we not only survived, but we have been able to grow. Yeah, yeah. Because my passion is, you know, in, in art. Mm-hmm. Um, but what I learned was that um, everyone given an opportunity wants to be able to share their knowledge. Mm-hmm. And the volunteers, they have all kinds of experience and knowledge. And what we can do is take that information and package it and put it in a proper place to be able for families to learn and grow together mm-hmm. from pe- other people's knowledge and experience. Yeah. And so, and that's what we, we've done. Is that's a, and that's how we've grown into all these different areas. I mean, I don't have background in engineering and science and right. you know but you bring uh, the people in right and and um it's been wonderful i mean it, it's today today i was at, at friday there's a noon conference call with engineers and scientists every friday you know that awesome. that i'm constantly learning from and they're involved in our programs and really uh are doing amazing stuff you know and um Last night I had a meeting with a geologist about a program in February, you know, that, uh, yeah, it was a three hour meeting where I'm just like, (laughs) (laughs) I feel stupid, you know, I'm like, they they have so much knowledge that is, you know, so I'm learning. And even on, uh, this last Tuesday, we had our volunteers, um, there is a naturalist and, um, a landscape architect and, um, uh, a chemical engineer that mm-hmm. uh, is passionate about uh, native plants, and we're picking out all the plants that that need to be planted for this coming spring. Right. And I, I was like, I felt like I was in a Latin class. <laughs> like they're just like you know, and they know all these things, and we retain all this information. And I'm learning from it. Uh, but not only that, our you know our community is going to be learning from their but, knowledge. And so passion. that stuff goes 
beyond like what it sounds like was originally just an, a sort of yeah, arts focused mission. That's changed. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, for sure. And is it grown. now just sort of like however you can serve, whether that's arts or whether that's yeah. So if you, I mean, it's uh, it's on our on our signs now and everything uh, that you know we are a community creative center. Cool. So um, and you, you know we want to be able to 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 share people's passions in in, in whatever way because actually what else uh, happened um, during that recession is there was a company that came out with a report uh, uh, they they really studied kids around the age of ten or eleven and um, they found that when when a child goes at that age goes to their parents and says mom dad give me something to do and and parents say, you know, go find something. So all of a sudden you have free time at your own discretion to do mm -hmm. whatever you want. So it might be, for me, it was uh, fishing and, paint, and painting. Right. My, my mom would roll out a big paper tablecloth and just let me push paint around, you know. Nice. Um, but uh, whether it's fly, kite, ride, but, you know, ride a bike, read a book, um, whatever you do at that age at your own discretion is what you're going to aspire to do on your free time or possibly wow. in your professional life, yeah. you know, for the rest of your life. Right, right. And so... What an amazing insight. Yeah, it, it really is. And so, you know, for us to be able to offer so much diverse content, um, you never know yeah. what, uh, you know, just like that glass blowing, you know, yep. you never know. There might be a child that, that said, you know what, I don't want to This is what I want to do. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And uh, wow, so. those formative experiences. And I guess like that makes me think in a way that I hadn't thought about your your work. Like what a responsibility to provide a wealth of experiences to the kids who come through at that age so that there is something that sort of everybody can, or as many people as possible can grab hold of. Yeah, I, th I, I feel that. Also, you know, when it first started to happen, I treated it as an art project. So mm -hmm. I told myself, you know, I'm gonna do this for three years. And uh, after three years, I'd probably go start another company or do something right in on. the creative field. Uh -huh. But um, I really did treat it like an art project. So anything goes and, you know, we're going to try out as much stuff as possible. Yeah. And then it, you know, it hooked me. So I'm, I'm here 20 years later. Right. Um, but what I found is that the, what happened brings uh, is a sense of hope, mm -hmm. you know. Um, I mean, when we first arrived in, in, in we tried to have, happened start in Northside, you know, from the very beginning. Mm -hmm. we, and we did some focus groups and we just couldn't get parents to come in to Northside. It was yeah. too rough. Yeah. And um, now over half of our visitors are coming in from outside of 45223. Right on. And so, you know, I think that happened has been instrumental in that change over the last 10, 12 years with with yeah. with Northside. Um, but a big part of that and a big responsibility, I think that we have is that we also bring this sense of hope Mm -hmm. And um, when we first started in Northside, there was four nonprofits. I think there's over 20 nonprofits in Northside wow. right now. Yeah, you know, yeah. they, they may not all be doing work in right. Northside, but that's where their they're home is, there, you know. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, and I think that uh, sometimes if you, uh, if you close or you don't make it, right, then that... Uh, that, that sense of hope goes away, mm. right? And sometimes it's worse than if you hadn't started in the right, first place, right? Right, 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 right you know? Um, but so I, I do think that, you know, uh, we've been instrumental in that, oh, you know, if they can make it, we can make it, we, we can, can figure it we out. We can stick you around know, too, Which is yeah. awesome, you know? Well, and I don't know, like, what is the organization? Like, how many people does Happen employ full-time or part-time? Right now we have two full-time and there are seven there's seven part-time and then yeah. how many uh, on an average month how many volunteers uh we rotate probably about 30 you okay. know volunteers that right. could be a you know uh in a lot of that seasonal uh -huh. so you know it depends on uh especially with all the gardens and things we have yeah. quite a few you know volunteers which is awesome the gardens are another way that you know we, you just don't have to, you know, be inspired by art. Right. You know, nature and art together. It has opened so many different doors to be able to share your passion. Yeah, yeah. So. That's, I mean, it's interesting because I think from, certainly you are the public face of Happen. I think you talked about that growth curve and then the recession. And it does seem like for a lot of people thinking about keeping an organization alive for 20 years, it would have to 
it would have to grow big enough that there would be, you know, 20 or 30 full-time staff and all of that. It, you, have, you have maintained it as a small organization at its core, mm-hmm. but with, a, like you said, like a large volunteer staff. Yeah, and I think that, um, I mean, well, I always like to think that we're small doing big things. Mm-hmm. And um, when I look back to where we were before the recession, which, you know, we were at nine full-time people, um, we had 14 on staff, nine full-time, the rest part-time. Mm-hmm. Um, I actually think that we're doing more now, mm-hmm. you know, and more creative uh, activities now than we were before. Because of the volunteer? I think that help. in that we, we've we've learned how to, like, hone our skills, you yeah. know, across the board of, of being able to, you know, get things done. Mm-hmm. And um, we're scrappy, you know. Yeah. It's like we're hustling, you know. And, and uh, so... Yeah, I think all those things put together is just like, you know, and I, and I feel like, hey, you know, we all have a limited amount of time here on this planet. So we're going to get as much stuff. Done <laughs> Might as, as well, we well can. do as much yeah. with it as you yeah. can. Yeah. yeah. I mean, is that um, I just think about the different if you want to put it this way, the job description from creative director, art director, artist to executive director. Are you are you still practicing art it, like has that has the facilitation of other people's art taken the place of your creative practice i have not practiced my own art in probably about five or six years mm-hmm. so um and just solely if you know focused on on happen i think uh the the cool thing about you know being in advertising is that you're always working with as a team mm-hmm. and yeah. and i'm still working you right. know as a team um to create these programs and uh, really relying on other people's knowledge, you know, that uh, I can help put together and put out there to the public. Um, mm-hmm. It's exciting, you know. Yeah. yeah. Is that surprising to you? Is the skill set that you have cultivated now, would that be surprising if you had looked, if 20 years ago you had looked at who you are now? Do you think you would have been as, you would have thought you would have been as fulfilled mm-hmm. by this as you are? Uh, I had no, I, no, I had no idea what I was getting into. Yeah. You know, I mean, I felt like I needed to do, um, what I was supposed to do at the time. Mm-hmm. And I didn't, uh, look past those three years of what, what it would bring and never imagined how big it would be. You well, know? you said that it hooked you. Mm-hmm. Like, do you remember what it was? Was there a moment where you were, where you were like, Oh, this isn't going to be a three-year thing. This is the this is the thing, or was that just sort of a gradual? I, th- I think it's. I think it was um, a gradual thing of many things happening. Uh-huh. You know, um, and uh, yeah, it just wasn't. It just wasn't one thing. But seeing parents and kids really enjoy working together and being able to offer that, um, and creating. You know, we say we create memories that last a lifetime, and that's just not. You know. Your, your your own memory. That's the f- a physical thing that you're right. taking home that, you know, just like my Christmas tree. Yeah, plate. That's right. That's yeah, yeah. right. You know, and uh, and those will bring back memories that, you know, hopefully uh, your kids will remember how important it was to them mm-hmm. and know that may it may not be happened, but spending time together, creating yeah. things together yeah. um, is a great way to bond. Are you getting like second generation? We are having kids coming yeah, through, which is pretty wild. You it's got to be. Yeah, yeah I had. Um, this was a few months ago. Um, a woman came in with her, her six-year-old and uh, let me know that uh, before they left that she was in the first year. Wow! You know of of happen. So, um, and we've had um, we recently had a jazz. We do these things also called house concerts. So we okay. have once a month we have music come. I didn't in. know that. Yeah, it's, it's fantastic. It's cool. We've had every thing from a bagpiper to which was really loud I yeah learned a lot yeah from that. Like, they carry <laughs> yes they do <laughs> this is definitely an uh, an outdoor <laughs> right right event uh but uh we've had jazz musicians and um we uh this this coming saturday the 21st we have a, a a teen band so there are three 15 year olds that put a band together they're going to come in so Fantastic. every month we have music um but we we brought in a uh jazz musician that was in our very first year of happen wow you know and yeah. it was just like awesome you know that's really see, really cool see that and, and then also uh we had a child michaela who came through all of her happen classes when she was young and then 
Um, she was part of our team program. And then last year, uh, we hired her for the summer, mm -hmm. you know? So she actually was an employee for a yeah. whole summer, which is really cool too. That's yeah. really, really cool. Yeah. Um, I, I want to talk a little bit about that. Um, I was talking before we started recording about like that sort of ad agency thing that, that you know, and we, and there, we talked about this on other episodes. There are people, we were talking about Jason Snell, mm -hmm. people who have been able somehow to sort of successfully balance their creative self and what that business takes from them. Um, I, I know so many people who they say, you know, I, I got out of college, I'm an artist, I'm a writer, I want to write a novel. And so I'm going to take this job in advertising for a little while to pay the bills and stabilize things. And then the fact that advertising sort of sells you on its sexiness, like what you're doing is supposedly important, the fact that it pays really well, right. it can be really difficult to extricate yourself from that. And I think there are a lot of people who said, I'm a creative person at heart. I want to do creative work with my life. I'm going to do this for a little while and then I'll get back to my thing mm -hmm. and never do. Do you think, and not all of them, you know, like the solution for all of them, obviously, some of them are fine. Some of them are like, no, this is, this is good. I'm all, I'm all right. But some of them are trying to figure out ways to get off that ship. Starting a nonprofit isn't obviously the answer for all of them. Right, right. But did you feel like there was a certain mental gymnastics that you went through or, or an equation that allowed you to, to I, make um, that jump? Well, I've, I've two things. <laughs> One, and, and maybe there, my, maybe my presumption is wrong, <laughs> no, which is no. that there are as many people trying to get out of that <laughs> no. as there are. Yeah, well, I would say, uh, it's just not advertising. So it's right, like, right, so, right. Um, pretty much every year, um, I between October and January, I will get a, a call, sometimes a couple calls from people that I have, I don't know, mm -hmm. and they say, "Hey, can I take you out to lunch? Can I buy you a coffee?" I heard your story. And, yeah, yeah, and uh, and they they're like, you know, I want to do something different. Hmm. I want to. Uh, you know, possibly start a nonprofit or do something, get out of the field they're in. So mm -hmm. it's not just advertising. It could be, Fair, I mean, yeah. it's, it's across the board. Totally, totally. And, um, and so, you know, I just talked to him about my, uh, mistakes <laughs> that I've made, you know, <laughs> but also the good things. And, uh -huh. and, you know, we, and, and, um, but, you know, I really, uh, and I also agree with what you just said was, you know, if everybody did what I did, uh, the world would be in a horrible shape, <laughs> you know? Um, so I really just ask people to just, uh, do some soul searching, you know, of like really soul searching, because I think that, um, y you can really find pretty much in whatever you're doing, right. There's, there's good in it. Yeah. Yeah. That is helping people yep. and be able to focus on those things and that, um, and, and, and give, give until it hurts a little bit. You don't have to do a crazy thing like I did, um, but give a little bit until it hurts. And what I mean by that is I, we always say it's my, the three M's, mind, money, and muscle mm -hmm. that you can give back. So uh, you don't necessarily have to start your own thing, but you can find some way to give back. And it doesn't even have to be in a way that is organized or, you know, mm -hmm. it could be just like, oh, you're about beautification. Well, you know, you can go out and pick up trash or find yep. a lot to mow or whatever. And that can just be your own thing, you know. Yep. Um, but I always say, like, if you're going to get involved in something, just give until it hurts a little bit, meaning you're giving up something. Mm -hmm. You're either giving up, you know, you're sore the next day because you physically went out and picked things up or, you know, you're uh, donating monetarily in a way that you might give up something that you really like, yeah. you know. And... Um, but just a little bit so that that will make you get more involved, more concerned, mm. you know, instead of just writing the check or, uh, you know, that that is not you're not going to think about again. Yep. Or uh, donating that one day, you know, with your coworkers or your peers as a team building and, you know, you're right. done. Right. And, yep. and, and check and you're the not, box. Right. And it, it's going it, to in most cases, you'll get more involved in that organization or get more inspired by what you're doing and, uh, and, and do more, mm -hmm. um, that doesn't take the risks that, you know, that I took. So, yeah. 
you know, which I don't actually recommend. <laughs> you don't. You know? Is there anybody that you've said that you've had that conversation with that you've said, you know what? It sounds to me like you need to do something crazy. Uh, not, not. And I don't know whether really. you at the time I mean, felt like it was that crazy or if it was just sort of the inevitable. It was. Uh, well, I mean, I put it this way. Uh, People thought I was crazy then. People still think I was crazy. I mean, bare, Barefoot, I think, at this point, one of the largest agencies in greater Cincinnati. Yeah, they're, yeah they're, but they're, they're part of the one of the three largest holding companies in the right, world. And, and, and globally. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. so right? So right. everyone's like, you know, what, is, what were you thinking? Enough to where, uh, yeah, I remember when I left the business career, did a story about right. me leaving, you know, it was like, and, and, and implied in there. Was, the subtext <laughs> is, what the hell is this guy thinking? Right, right. Yeah, yeah, right. But, so, um, you know, and, and I did learn, I mean, in that, uh, I mean, it has been a roller coaster and mm-hmm. it's been tough. And, and I can tell you some stories that would, you know, it's like, oh, you would think I'm crazy because of the tough times that that's happened. What, and one of the things that I always say is what I didn't, you know, when I have those talks, it's what I didn't understand or didn't think about is that people, you know, I'm willing to take this roller coaster ride, right? Mm-hmm. And... The people that are around you, your friends and your family that really love you, mm-hmm. that really, really love you, they're going to take that roller coaster ride with you, yeah. whether they wanted to get on or not. <laughs> right? right. Right. That's and, a great point. Um, and so that's the downside is yeah. that, you know, it's not always, you know, uh, it's not always great. There's there's really some tough yeah, times yeah. and uh, and you kind of force those people to go through those tough times. Have with people you. tried to talk you out of it? Oh yeah, yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, you know, <laughs> like, you know, what are you doing? When are you going to quit? What, right. What's going on? You know. Um, and I always say, you know, God will tell me. <laughs> you know, I mean, I, I just really believe that, that. You know, we're here for a short time, and things will work out for a reason. And it's just, you know, as soon as, uh, as soon as I feel like that, uh, there's something that, that. Like, okay, you know, what am I doing? Something will happen that mm-hmm. will reinsure, like, oh, I'm doing the right thing. I'm yeah. where I'm supposed to be. Yeah. And I've been able to do some really stuff that I would have never imagined when I started to happen that, yeah. you know, things just, you know, I mean, been in Wall Street Journal. Yeah, yeah. Been on CNN Financial News, you know, just like, holy cow, you know, these but things it, just happen. That's like the, the answer to if you think the... The big business advertising world is flashy and sexy. Like, you know, yeah. if that's what you're looking for is the press. You've had just as much of it as you might in that world as well. One of the, Not uh, that that's what you're looking for. One of the best experiences that happened, I mean, outside of our programming is there was an advertising agency in uh, Cincinnati was pitching to Nike. And, uh, you know, I didn't know at the time that, uh, you know, the CEO... CEO of Nike loves toys, so his whole office is filled with toys. Really, and so um, we were we were kind of the hook. We were the activity. So N- Nike air freighted our mobile toy unit out to Portland, and you know my background in advertising, I was just it was amazing because yeah. I got to make toys with every. They had a, a global conference going on that 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 week, so How every cool. brand manager on a global level from for every part of their business was making toys with me. <laughs> How know? great. Yeah. And then, uh, oh, I love it. You know, they, uh, in, in Nike style, they, uh, they, they had, uh, which I didn't know this was going to happen. They had museum quality, uh, uh, displays, you know, with acrylic tops right. set up and everything. And so their toys went on display in the Tiger Woods center for a month. How cool. You know? And, uh, I thought that they would ask me, uh, to leave after cause we built toys in the morning yeah. and, and, uh, you know, I had to sign all these non-disclosures and everything. Um, and then we, they had lunch, and uh, they didn't ask me to leave. So <laughs> for the rest around? of the afternoon, I got to sit in and listen to them do a roundtable of all their advertising, what last year was, and what wow. they're planning on for the next two years. And, right you know, on. it was awesome. Oh, I bet. You know, it was really exciting. So, you know, that kind of stuff is just yeah, like, yeah. you know, I mean, that, that, that fulfills me on that level right right but then you know we have this garden um in in north side that's a little 25 foot by 25 foot 
space. And mm -hmm. I just love to tell the story because uh, it was, this had trash in it and everything. And I, I went to the owner and said, you know, rent it to us for a dollar a month and we'll turn it into something beautiful. So now it's this flower garden that p anybody can use. You can go and have lunch. A lot cool. of people don't have backyards because they're in parks. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. you can have lunch, you can read a book, you can do whatever you, you like there. And, um, the, uh, and it's really, really beautiful. And so I was down there working and there, the old Chase Commons school, the mm -hmm. old Chase school, which is now condos, um, a lot of seniors live in, in that. And that's directly across the street. Yep. So a woman came down as my age and uh, she said, you know, my mother lives in those condos and she loves your garden. And I was like, oh, awesome. You know, let me know when she's down here. I'd love to meet her. She goes, well, she's in mobile. She can't really get around anymore. Mm. So I looked up at the front of the building and I was like, tell me what window she's in because I will wave to <laughs> oh, her, you know, sweet. right? And she said she actually lives on the front side of the building so she can't see the garden. Uh -huh. So I just looked at it and, she, and the woman explained that when the roses bloom, she can actually smell the roses from oh, across the street. Wow. Right? And that's really beautiful. You know, it's like that kind of stuff that yeah. quantifies. Yeah. Like yeah. I would never thought that that right. was going to affect someone in that way. Right. And um, and those things have happened to me at every point where I'm like, what am I doing? Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. And then something like that happens. And yep. it's like, oh, I got it. I'm supposed to be doing this. Yeah. 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 So just like you were saying, if you're going to. If you, it was going to be time to move on, something would have to show you. It's like you've gotten right. the you've gotten the opposite answer. Yeah. Yeah. Did you did you grow up with like a um, a specific sense of of work, like a uh, a model, you know, or an expectation around like what you thought your your job would be? Um, it sounds like you were you were yeah. obviously making art yeah. pretty pretty seriously early on. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I I, I think until I really got into uh, into in the college, I, I realized that, you know, I definitely have a passion for art. Mm -hmm. um, until then, I wasn't really sure. Um, but I knew, you know, I knew that I loved to draw. I knew I'd love to paint. And, um, and I learned, I mean, this is another thing, like, teachers can come from anywhere. They just mm -hmm. don't have to come from school. So mm -hmm. um, when I was a kid, you know, you've watched the movie Forrest Gump. Yeah. So I had the same metal braces on my legs. Oh, as wow. Really? Forrest Gump did. Uh -huh. So, um, so my, uh, my, my parents put me in ballet when I was three to help strengthen my legs. Okay. And it did. And, um, I'm not, I'm not a very good dancer, but <laughs> it did, uh, it did help strengthen my legs, but more than anything, uh, I learned how to draw because, uh, there was a costume and set designer, his name was Larry Dolliver, who would come into the, the actual studio while the rehearsals were going on, and he would draw. Wow. And me, I was the only boy in the class, and mm -hmm. so I only had small parts, you know, especially when I was a kid. I was like, you know, yeah. the kid that tapped the cane and the bunnies come out and, you know, <laughs> we run across the stage. Right. And so... Um, Larry would 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 actually uh, pull up a stool and I would watch him draw. How cool! Um, until and then sometimes he would actually have a pad of paper and I would just copy what he's doing. So at a very young age, all of a sudden I'm learning, uh, you know, how powerful space is mm -hmm. and 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 how powerful we are in that space and what negative space. Without him explaining, I'm just watching him. Yeah. And and you know, contour drawing and, and I was, and I didn't realize until I went into an eighth grade, uh, art class and we did some drawings and the teacher came to me and said, what, who, what lessons are you, you know, who's <laughs> teaching you? you yeah, know? yeah. Yeah. And, uh, nobody, you know, it was, wow. uh, you know, this set designer that, um, from a very young age for years and years that I could just, you know, watch and follow and learn how to draw, um, without having the definition or, you mm -hmm. know, really, understanding what I was, I was just like, right. that's what you do. You right, know? right. So that's amazing. Yeah. Do you, uh, you talked about like, you know, maybe that, maybe that kid who watched the glass blowing thing is going to grab a hold of that. Do you think as you're, as you're working with these kids, do you think about work? Do you think about like the, the conception that you're creating? And then I'm not, I'm not talking about jobs so much as I am talking about like, you know, there's, there's like vocation in the, in terms of calling, in terms of a thing you might grab hold of to do for your life, whether that's your job or not. 
do you think about that in terms of what you're exposing these Absolutely. kids to? Absolutely. Yeah, I do. I mean, because even even last night uh, in this meeting, it was a great meeting with the geologists, is that we went through and that you don't have, you know, if you study geology, it's not all about rocks, mm -hmm. you know? It's about all these different things in, of, of nature. And yeah. there's all these different areas in that field that you can study. Or when we're doing, you know, we have a, a film class. And so a lot of kids come in thinking, okay, well, I'm an actor, I'm a, dire a director. But we make sure that they realize that there's all these different avenues, you know, and they're all creative avenues right. that need, have to be there, you know, to be able to create this one thing, this one film, you yeah, know. Yeah. And so, um, yeah, we absolutely teach that and I think about that and everything that 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 we do along with um, just giving kids experience of working together you know um, mm -hmm. we have a program called breadwinners where it's been about six or seven years ago we uh, surveyed kids the council did actually surveyed kids in the neighborhood of what they wanted to do mm -hmm. and the number one thing was to make money and about fourth on the list was to design their own clothes. And so okay. we uh, already did our own, you know, T-shirt screen printing uh, in-house. And so I thought, okay, let's just try this and we'll put together a program for kids to learn how to uh, create and screen and, 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 and sell their mm -hmm. own T-shirts. And it has been awesome. Right on. Um, and these kids, you know, it's an entrepreneurship program. Um, and where they, they make the money. So we, say we sell a shirt for $10. Yep. $3 goes to buy more shirts and materials. $1 goes to graffiti removal in Northside, mm -hmm. which the kids have do already donated over $2,000 to community council for wow. graffiti removal. And then um, uh, they keep the rest. Awesome. So, you know, when we're, when we're making shirts and selling shirts, they're making, they're making money. Yeah, yeah, you know? they're motivated. And, to... uh, yeah, and it's really awesome in that, you know, there's there's child labor laws that, you know, say you can only work, you know, at uh -huh. a certain age and in and, right. and, and a certain time. Right. Yep. Which is awesome. It's great that we have that. What it doesn't say is how much money they can make. Right? OK. I mean, th so these kids in some cases are making thirty dollars an hour when they're you know, screening shirts. That's fantastic. So, and it's not all the time. I mean, sometimes we're working on the designs and we're, we're working on marketing or, you know, any of those things, but, uh, you know, they're making, they're making real money now. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I've already had two companies come to us that said, you know, when a teen ages out at 17, it's a 13 to 17 year old, mm -hmm. they will hire them, no interview, and I asked him, you know, why I was like, uh, he was like, well, we've hired some of your breadwinners now and they have job skills. That's great. They're working together. They, they have customer service. They have yeah. a work ethic, you know, yeah. um, they're creative. Nothing's going to stop them. You know, they got to figure out things as they go. And, um, they were like, yeah, we'll, we want to be their next stepping stone as a part-time job for when they go to college or any of wow. those things. So Pretty wow. cool. That's very, very cool. And I mean, that's the kind of stuff that like you talk about what a community arts organization is doing. That might not be the stuff that people immediately connect as the result of, of programs that you're running. Yeah. And that's where we really have gone back and said, you know what, we're, we're more than the arts. Mm -hmm. um, and, and we really are a, a, a community creative center. Wow. So, um, yeah. and, uh, and that's how it's grown. So is there anything that you've wanted to do either recently or in the distant past that you haven't been able to, but like, you know, like a, a, a dream project or a some, someday we'll do this thing. Um, uh, well, I don't, I don't want to spoil anything because, <laughs> okay. you know, there's stuff, there's definitely stuff coming up, but I, I think that, uh, you know, I, I, I mean, I have a passion in art I, and I do have a passion with, with nature and, and, and gardening and, and growing in those ways too. So it's been a real blessing that I've been able to, you know, experience and learn in all these different areas too. But I think media is, uh, I would okay. say... Um, you know, we, you mentioned the game show. Yeah, you yeah. Know, well, earlier. talk about that a little bit. What was, because it sounds like there were maybe a couple of different a attempts at that. What, what yeah. were those? Um, well, we, uh, with 
we started out with a small scale. I, we were asked us to do all these events all the time. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and, and I was like, you know, the big events are probably not where we, because it takes up a year of your time, yeah. you know, and it was really, I think, hurting our programs. Is that it takes resources away from the other stuff. Yeah. So yeah. I was like, you know, we don't necessarily need to do these giant events where we got, you know, two semis and think loading in. Loading. I mean, it's just crazy. Mm -hmm. So. Um, but we were still getting asked to do small festivals and things. Okay. So I put together a traveling game show that we didn't have to reinvent the wheel every time we went okay. to an event. We could just run this game show, and it nice. got pretty popular. Um, so we were doing it a lot, but everything fit into two 24-foot trucks, and okay. you know we would go out and do it until the point where um, I was like, okay, well, maybe we could you know, turn this into a show. <laughs> So, and what's the, describe loosely what the premise of the game show is. This one was called Game Show Goulash. So it's kind of Nickelodeon feel. Okay. Of, uh, but it had uh, a lot of art inspiration and, right. and education into it. But it was wacky. You could get, you know, paint all over you yeah, yeah. and this crazy stuff oh, going cool. on. We had characters. and yep. um, So, well, before we thought TV, we thought, let's just take it on, um, take it on, build it out big scale and take mm -hmm. it on the road. So okay. it was... Uh, well, it's still, it fit in three 24-foot trucks. And um, and we did it for a year. Uh, and we went to different places like the zoo and, you know, and put right on, on these performances. Um, but it was expensive. So, you okay. know, it was, uh, you know, for us to do that, it would cost a, a company or festival like $5,000 for mm -hmm. us to come in and do those things. Okay. So this is very limited of, how you know, how many festivals can can we do? In and around Cincinnati, <laughs> right, unless right, you like really right. ramp it up and right. take it on the road, yeah. Right. So then I thought, okay, well, let's just try it out as a pilot. Okay. And uh, so we uh, we recorded it at uh, CET uh -huh. and um, the- uh, It's a local PBS station here in, in Cincinnati. Yeah and, yeah, and and so we were in there for three days and um, we had different volunteers from the the community uh, help us out, and uh, it didn't. It didn't make it on air, <laughs> but I learned a lot. In fact, I don't know whether I'm hoping that I'm still allowed back in CET. <laughs> oh, really? Does well, it exist? Do the tapes of it, or have they been burned? And uh, yeah, no, I have some of the the, the cuts and everything. But uh, one of the funny stories is I didn't know, like we were going to at the end of the show, we did a glitter drop. Uh-huh. Okay. Oh, I bet they love that in the studio. <laughs> <laughs> Not There's only still that, glitter. Yeah, that's years, why I'm wondering whether <laughs> they're still remembering because I had a friend that uh -oh. uh, that worked there, and like two months afterwards, yeah, yeah. Uh, she called me up. She goes, I just want to let you know that I found glitter today in my office. Oh. <laughs> it tracked through the entire building, you know. Yeah, it'll at some never, point. Yeah. ever, ever go right, away. Right, right. And we, we really over glittered. Like, it was like on stage, it was at least two feet tall of glitter. <laughs> kids, I couldn't keep kids out of it. I mean, it just went nuts. And it was, we had a live audience there. So it was wow. just like, Wow. But uh, anyway, it was a lot of fun. And, um, you know, I think that at that time, what I learned was high production costs a lot of money. Yeah. And, um, you know, trying to find the the outlets for that at the time, I mean, several years ago, mm -hmm. um, was really tough. But um, now I think that expectations of production with the internet or has really yeah, yeah, yeah. gone down, right. you know, and, uh, the and cost distribution been, models and all of that stuff has changed. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. And we have a ton of content. So I cool. think that, uh, you know, I think, uh, back to your original question is I think, you know, media is yeah. definitely a focus of, you know, where cool. we're headed. Cool. Cool. And is that a matter of, and I don't want to give anything away, but I mean, you, uh, this is a nonprofit. It's funded by donations and volunteer things. Is that the kind of thing that like, if somebody's listening and they're like, I want to get behind that. Yeah, I think the way that this definitely runs is through, um, you know, I, I'm proud that we have our content both, you know, just in our studio and the things that, that we produce outside of our studio are valued enough where sponsors mm -hmm. get behind and say, you know, we want to be a part of this. Not because, oh, we should do something good in the community, is that it's also good for their brand, you yeah. know? So um, I think we've really worked hard to make sure that we're at that level. And, cool. um, you know, and I'm proud of that. So Nice. You know. Is there anything in general, you know, the podcast is about meaningful work, and that means different things for as many different people 
as are listening. Is there anything that over the course of this work you have learned about your conception of meaningful work um, that has changed? That, you know, that if you would say, if I could talk to myself 20 years ago when I'm taking this thing on about like what I think meaningful work encapsulates, what does that mean to you these days? Um, I think, I think figuring out me, meaningful work for me, what really drives me is that I know that I am really, and I, I this is so wide, but knowing that you're making a difference, I mean, a true difference, mm -hmm. um, and being able to be a part of that is, uh, really amazing when, when you know that you're right there, you know, I mean, part of that, you know, when I talk about part of our growth rate of 25%, mm -hmm. I mean, what I found myself doing at that point before the recession is I was pushing a lot of paper, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. I was dealing with a lot yep. of paperwork. I wasn't actually in the studios hardly at right. all. Right. And I, I didn't have, I couldn't see exactly what was going on. And so I wasn't getting that meaningful yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. reaction back. So like, you know, this last Sunday we have on, on Sundays we offer up where uh, parents can sign up. If they have infants, mm -hmm. if they have little ones. You can mm -hmm. do handprints and footprints and clay. Yeah. And we get a lot of requests around this time of year because we cut five slabs for you. And it's great for gifts for grandparents and all yeah. that. And it's totally free, you know. And, um, you know, so Sunday I got to sit in and watch this young family, you know, take their, you know, eight-month-old and, and do handprints. And I'm like, you know, we're creating memories forever. That's beautiful. And uh, so those kind of things that I can be directly involved in. Yeah. Um, and last night. Uh, this happened last night. We had uh, one of our teens that is really struggling. His family's really struggling. And we had um, a volunteer donate some clothes. Mm -hmm. And I was like, you know, I think I know the kid that can use this. And uh, he brought the clothes down. And there was like 10 pair of shoes. And most of them have never been worn still in the oh, box. Wow. You know, there's a pair of Jordan running shoes in there. I mean, so... You know, I got to sit down with this kid and he's trying on all these, you know, and Jack has said never been worn, right. you know. I mean, and I was figuring it up. I was looking up on my phone, like each item, you know, and uh, yeah. the kid got like over a thousand dollars worth of new clothes. And last not night. like somebody's secondhand stuff, right. but like right. stuff he can be proud of, stuff he's going to wear to yeah. school and like. Yeah. yeah. And to see the look on his face every time. And, and I was surprised every time he opened up a box and there's like, whoa, you know, it's like, uh. You know, and kids never gonna forget that. Yeah, you know, and that's some Christmas right there. Right, right, for real. And uh, and I can be a part of that. Yeah, you know, um, I always say, you know, I'm the I'm the guy in the back of the scrapbooks, hmm. in the back of the pictures, right? I'm the, I'm the <laughs> they're taking a picture of like uh -huh. they built a toy or whatever. Right. You know, I'm the guy in the background, um, and. Just like that swim coach, like, I don't remember his name. Yeah. I don't even remember what he looks like, actually. You know, I can't remember that. Yeah. But I can remember the time, you know, that I spent with my, my, my father and, uh, and how important that, you know, he's probably passed away by now, mm -hmm. you know, but, but how important that that swim coach was yep. and how that is inspired to reach hundreds of thousands of people yeah. in the same way. Yeah. Um, you know, I know that. I'm the, the guy in the background in the scrapbook, you know, but what a blessing for me is that I'm able to uh, enjoy and, and be there for all these firsts for parents and kids yeah, yeah. to build their first toy, to put their, you know, totally. build their first clay object or whatever it is, yep. you know, or like a couple weeks ago, we had horses in our garden. So we had horse rides, you know, so I awesome. got kids on the first horse and like, ah, oh, I get to experience that firsthand. It's really awesome. And how many how many thousands of scrapbooks are you yeah. in the back of, whether they're literally? <laughs> I was or actually in a meeting. Um, this is several years ago, but but uh, we were going around introducing ourselves, and the woman right next to me goes, "I, you know, we haven't met, but I know who you are because she had recently been looking at her nieces had looked at a scrapbook. Wow! And the, you're <laughs> literally, her, yeah, the yeah, guy. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's yeah, really beautiful. Yeah. Which is, uh, you know, really cool. So those kind of things. Yeah. I know I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing. And, and it uh, sounds like that doesn't escape you. I, I think there are a lot of people who nonprofit work is hard. It can be thankless. It can be all of these different things that we've talked about, like hounding 
going to board meetings, putting up with stuff like getting, you know, fundraising and all of that stuff. It sounds like you are a guy who also takes time for reflection and that, and that the, the, the immediate meaning of what you're doing isn't lost on you, that you do take time to sit back and sort of soak in the benefit, in the benefit of it that yeah, people are getting. It's like, a. it's not that I sit back and like, think about it. It's, it's, it's forced upon me. Hmm. You know what I mean? Like, mm-hmm. like all of a sudden it's just like, I can be, uh, I don't know, just have a wonderful experience, not expect it, not think about it, but it's like so much in front of me that you have to recognize it yeah. and go, wow, you know, there's a reason why this just happened. Right on. And you know, how blessed am I to be able to be a part of it? You know? Yep. Well, I mean, it sounds like very, and it's, I, I certainly know that the community around happen there in Northside and all the people that you're touching in Cincinnati, even outside of Northside. There's a lot of, a lot, a lot of folks. Thank you. That are, uh, you're, you're touching a lot of lives. Thanks. My 17 year old and very soon my two year old when yeah. we, when we drag him over. That's awesome. Tommy, thank you. thank you for what you're doing and thank, thank you, you for, for taking the time to talk about it today. Really, really appreciate it. Thank you. I enjoyed it. This episode of The Distiller was recorded live at Tila Bar and Kitchen, a great gastropub with updated American classics at 1212 Springfield Pike in Wyoming, Ohio. Thanks again to owners Dub Naraki and L.R. Hunley for welcoming us in. You can find links to Tila's website and social media pages on our website, see the menu and find out more, and stop by Tila for lunch or dinner every day except Monday and Sunday brunch, and tell them you heard it on The Distiller when you do. Huge thanks, of course, to my guest, Tommy Roof. You can visit Happen, Inc. in person at 4201 Hamilton Avenue in Cincinnati. Happen has programs for kids from, I think Tommy said, two years old to teenagers just about every day of the week. Visit their website, happeninc.com, for more information, including program schedules, events. And if you're listening to this before Christmas, there is a lot of great stuff going on at Happen. So check out their website for the holidays. You can find links to the Happen website and social media pages on our website at thedistillerpodcast.com. Tommy and the team are doing such great work. Please do visit, support, volunteer, and help this amazing work continue for another 20 years. The Distiller is produced and recorded and hosted by me, Brandon Dawson. Our show is mixed by Justin Golden. Logos by Scott Ryan. Design video work by Mike Helm of Minute Moments Pictures. You can find The Distiller wherever you listen to podcasts. Listen, download every episode of The Distiller at thedistillerpodcast.com, where you'll also find links, photos of the guests, and a map of all of the show locations. If you enjoyed this episode, please tell somebody about it. Follow, like, and share our posts on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And if you want to help us make more of these episodes, just go to the website and click on the Become a Patron button for more information about how you can do that. And finally, please do take a second to rate and review The Distiller wherever you listen. We will be eternally grateful. Until next time, I'm Brandon Dawson, and thanks for listening to The Distiller. Bye-bye.